advice and input, you're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Cooper Krause. He'll be sitting in for Matt Watson today. Cooper, what's up? What's up? Part two. Happy to be back. Part two, and we're back. And we're back, and we're back. How many times can we say that? Now, uh, once again, part two of a three-part series about selling stuff. We like selling stuff and speaking of selling stuff. Today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. That also happens to be the product and services that Cooper and I sell. Got to plug Fullscale. Yeah, Fullscale. Is a, uh, who owns it? Those are our over our robot overlords <laughs> at Startup Hustle. So, um, yeah, I do a lot of different stuff there. But you know, it, nothing happens at a business until somebody sells something. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, as we mentioned, this is a three-part series. My regular co-host, Matt Watson, has just had a beautiful baby boy, and we're letting him uh, maybe get some sleep whenever or wherever he can. I, I did talk hey. to Matt this morning. I said, how you doing, buddy? He said, I'm tired. Yeah. Said, that's about par for the course. So I think we could invigorate him by selling more stuff. But in order to do that, we're going to have to get our, we're going to have to get it together a little bit. Now, as we mentioned, this is part of a three part series. If you want to learn about prospecting for sales, for sales prospecting, that's the other episode. Going to release these three days in a row. So if you're a regular listener and you don't care about selling, sorry, but you probably should because once again, uh, the best form of non-dilutive capital is revenue. Yeah. And really nothing says more about your product, everything, than selling stuff. So we talked in the last part of this three-part about prospecting and looking for sales. And we said that that's a very, very, very important part of selling. It's the difference between great salespeople and salespeople. Right. Um, Cooper, you are the sales director at full scale and you do a great job at all this stuff, but you know, if we, once we prospect for a new client or someone, Mm -hmm. someone to buy something, what next? You have to know how to keep the energy up. It's kind of the, the metaphor that always stuck with me is keeping a pop can in the air. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of like you you have a, uh, a a pistol with a certain amount of bullets, and you've got to keep the pop can in the air for as long. I as I see, can. I see. Yeah, like the old carnival game or something, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I see is the the next step um, in in terms of discovery or scoping or understanding how you're actually going to add value to the the prospect that you're trying to make a client. And, and turn that into a long-term relationship. Um, and I think the most important and first step is to, first of all, not sell anything. Um, and, and the first part of discovery, it's, it's much more about um, developing a, a genuine curiosity for what it is they're trying to accomplish. Sure. And, you know, this whole sales discovery process, sometimes people call it qualifying, um, you know, it's, it really is exactly like you said it, uh, first off, you have to be non self-serving. Like you said, it, yeah. it's not about, Hey, I'm trying to sell you something because in most cases you don't have the ability to sell someone something unless you know what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And, you know, I'm really of the, the, the belief that great salespeople are problem solvers and, you know, buyers buy things because now there's a lot of reasons that people buy things. And, you know, we, that we could get into another three part series about the psychology of that, but really in the end, it's to solve a problem. It's to make life easier, make money, uh, save money. Uh, sometimes it's status. Uh, there's a number of, of reasons that people do stuff. Sometimes there's, you know, the, it's a fear of loss, fear of mm-hmm. missing out. There's a whole lot of different things, but, you know, really, you know, in, in the, 
overall, if you don't know what what problem you're trying to solve, it makes it pretty difficult as a salesperson in, in most cases. Now, I'm going to make this really simple. So a long, long time ago, I worked in the piano business and people would come to the store and there'd be like 125 pianos in the store. Some of them are grand pianos. Some of them are digital. Some of them are upright pianos. And we'd have, here comes a lady coming in the door and she's holding hands with like a six-year-old and looking out at this sea of really expensive, really crazy selections, amounts of stuff, trying to figure out what, so what, what am I going to buy? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, so the very first thing when it came to that and, you know, look, this is, like I said, a very simplistic and, and even a pretty old school example because who's out buying pianos these days. But right. you know, the first question is, is, is for me was like, okay, if, if you're holding hands with a six year old, is, is this your future? Is this your future pianist? Yeah. Is this, yeah. is this your user? Like who's yeah. going to use this? I would very quickly, and sometimes I think sales discovery is about asking the right questions. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, here it is. Okay, so had you given any consideration about what you wanted to buy? What does it look like? What kind mm-hmm. of budget did you want to stay in? How soon are you thinking about doing something? Yeah. Do you potentially have something else that you of value that you want to trade in for this? Now, you know, these are all these are all just very simple. Things, are you the person that makes the buying decision? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And I didn't want to shoot off all the cannons right away. But when you talk about having a curiosity, now yeah. that was a retail type transaction. And at full scale, we ask a, a lot of similar questions, but technology yeah. related, you know, like, what are you using now? Where, what stage is your business at? What, mm-hmm. what technology do you see yourself using? What kind of resources do you have? What's your experience? Have you worked with remote developers in the past? And yeah. if so, where? And yeah. And how was it? You know, yeah. And those, yeah, exactly. Like what, what was great? What was not? And yeah. so like back to the lady in the piano store, I, I, some, I would sometimes say, so when you picture this being in your home, tell me what it looks like. Mm. And they'd say, oh, I, I, I see a cherry wood and it has, it stands up. It's not like a grand piano. It just stands up. So one of those that like goes on the wall, which is called an upright piano. And it has those like curly legs on the front. You know, those are, those are French provincial to be fancy there, but Still got you it. know, Still got it. sometimes asking a couple simple questions and we went from 125 options down to three. Yeah, exactly. And you didn't sell. She sold. No. She's I'm dead. trying to, uh, yeah, this is all for purposes of efficiency because, right. you know, prior to figuring that part of life out, nah, I'm, nah, I would have been walking the aisles of the, of the store and, you know, like, Hey, is this it? No, is this it? No, is this it? No. I mean, we don't even know why. Now, <laughs> one thing I figured out in that business is it could sound great, but if it didn't look the way that the buyer wanted, eh, these are items that last 60 to a hundred years. So it's yeah. going to be around for a while. You know, it wasn't exactly disposable, so. Right. Yeah, the aesthetic's got to be nice on the on the piano. So, you know, when you talk about developing that curiosity and then, you know, at that point, I mean, that that it's usually conversational. And, yeah. you know, I, I, that's that's a, a really fair exchange. Uh, I would recommend. Now, look, it's it's difficult to to give any and all industries a, def- a well and completely perfect list well-defined and perfect list of what kind of questions you should ask. But, right. you know, the basic things about que- who, what, where, when, yeah. and why. Yeah. It's a good place to start. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, especially you, you mentioned developing that, that curiosity. And I think if you can move off of the solution, if you can not focus on what you're trying to sell and actually try to learn more about, what they're trying to accomplish and it, it makes the conversation a lot more natural and easy for them to get involved with because say you don't know a lot about a particular um, industry or product that they're trying to develop all those questions that are tied to your lack of knowledge will not come off like that they'll come off as hey i'm just trying to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and what a successful end state looks like and all the, and that's just giving you your ammunition to tailor the message at some point. Yeah. Now, you know, full scale, when I talk to clients, I'll, I'll 
I mean, sometimes I'm just really direct and I'm usually talking to people that don't have, I mean, they appreciate that. What's the biggest, what's the, what's one thing or what are a few things at your business that you would like to, or really wish you did a lot better? Mm. Yeah. And And that, I think that's a magic question because, because, you know, Selling more and spending less is always really, really appealing, but peace of mind has this, this very intangible value and Mm -hmm. solving frustration, um, is, is big, you know? So like what, and, and once again, asking the right questions will lead to someone telling you exactly what they're interested in buying. Mm -hmm. My, my favorite, uh, magic question is, what what happens if it doesn't get solved, or how much does it cost if it doesn't get solved? Yeah, because that's, yeah, that's I agree. Uh, and to your, to your point, I mean, when you ask him that question, that's we're, we're talking to founders, co-founders, CEOs, and CTOs. So they're they're always going to have an answer for something they could do better because that's that's all they're concerned with. Yeah, and you, you know, you in in our notes here, you use the phrase "be happy being dumb." Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those are your words, but <laughs> as, you start, as you started at full scale, I even said something similar to that a lot. Yeah. I was like, hey, look, we can't know everything about everything. Yep. So sometimes you just have to say, hey, hey, look, I'm not the right person to answer that question, but I know who is. Yeah. It's gonna take me, it's gonna take me a little bit. Let me go check this out because I want to give you good information. I think the worst thing you can do is try to get yourself out of your depth. <laughs> and as, cause look, the, the, in, in a lot of, in a lot of sales transactions, you're, you're not, you're going to be the dumbest person in the room. Yeah. I mean, on yeah. some levels and that's okay. What is important is getting that, the quality of that information high. Mm-hmm. Cause if, if you, you'll lose trust immediately if you're trying to fake it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And as somebody who knows what they're talking about knows when people don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt. And, and the problem is, is by trying to get a little, little deeper than you, well, when you're below what some would call recreational depth, which <laughs> yeah. is, which is a diving term, you know, you have yeah. like these recreational divers. And then when you get down to a certain depth, like you better know what you're doing or you're, you're operating in a dangerous in a dangerous area. Yeah. So, you know, and that's back to that continue continuation of asking questions, gaining clarity, Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it also like, I mean, this is, this is the listening part, uh, still like, you know, really a great salesperson is listening for a whole lot of different stuff, a whole lot of different stuff. If you interview a salesperson and they tell you that they love to talk and that's why they like sales, what is your thought? I don't hire them. Right. Yeah. I don't hire them. Yeah. Yeah. For, for like a number of different reasons. I mean, <laughs> I mean a whole lot, especially at full scale. Cause this isn't uh, this isn't a, a talk, 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 talk sales transaction. I mean, we, we are uh, rely on a more consultative yep. type sale. And like I mentioned, like we just do so many things and so many of so much of it uh, technologically is at this really high level. It's like, I, it, I, there's no way I could be an expert on all of it. And, and it's new. you have people that might be, yeah. Yeah. Pardon? And it's it's new. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is. And some of it's not. And it does. It's, I still don't understand a lot of it. I mean, I tell people I write checks, not code. I don't <laughs> pretend to, to be a developer. Now, on the flip side, I, I, I'm I able to relate very well with most of our buyers because, well, I've been, I, I've been building technology and investing in technology and doing a lot of that for a decade. And. You know, I, I, I think that we we bill our company as being by founders for founders, right? Kind of like this podcast is for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And I mean, that's, that's the thing. So where can you relate to someone and where can you know when you need to be happy being dumb? So, yeah. And this is kind of a, uh, it's, it's related, but a little bit adjacent. I think a, a, a good experience for all salespeople to have is to become a buyer at some point if they can. And more than just being like a B2C buyer, like going into a store and buying a piano, like I had the chance to become a buyer of staffing and consulting services whenever I was at Black and Beach. 
And that was the first time I was on the other side of the table and got to understand a little bit about what that conversation felt like as the buyer and opened up an entirely new, entirely new perspective for how you, how you approach that conversation. Um, I think that's, that's a really, a really good experience for someone to, to have whenever they're in a sales seat when it comes yeah, to- I, you know, I, I built technology for myself and employed and hired and had ups and downs with software developers for years mm-hmm. before I ever sold the services. And that's what I said, there's, oh, a, yeah. there's, a, there's a level of empathy and understanding. And, you know, that's actually helped me sell. Cause I mean, I can talk to a founder of a tech company and say, Hey man, Bend in your shoes. I know what it's like to wake up at two in the morning and wonder if I'm going to go broke, if I'm crazy, or if every decision I've made up to this point is it was it wrong, right? And that goes a lot a long way because you know it's like I said, it's I mean we try to build our company around solving problems for for people like us the yeah. same way we built solved it solving our own. So yeah. okay, that kind of leads to the next thing on our list at pretending you work for that company now. Yeah. I'll I, I tell our cl- the clients at full scale all the time and say, look, your success is our success. If we can't help our clients find success, they're not going to stay clients. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that part of it is, is like that. Therefore, it, you know, in a consultative st- type sale, um, that's crucial. That's crucial. And, you know, now in different types of sales, like, I mean, this is, this is just textbook empathy. Like what, what do you think a buyer would need? What would they want? You know, we go back to that music store reference. We used to get uh, people that come into, yeah, I used to manage a chain of music stores. If you haven't, if you were unaware of that in the past, but uh, people come in and they want to buy a guitar for a kid. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not doing that person a, if a, a ser- much of a service if I don't sell them a tuner and some guitar picks and probably a, a, an extra pack of strings. Right. And, you know, like, and so that empathetic part of selling, whether it's to, for services or products, like, yeah. you know, and that's a, the kind of pretending you work for them or pretending you're in their shoes, which is literally empathy, which mm-hmm. means that putting yourself in people's shoes. Yeah. Um, well, first off, it would help you sell more stuff if you were on that retail side that I just mentioned. And, you know, like what would they like and what would they wouldn't, what, what would really cause them to not want to be a client? Yeah. And, these might, are important piss them off. and that can be a long list. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so there was somebody in the first podcast that I mentioned, a guy named Mahan Kalsa, uh, who, who wrote a book, um, called let's get real, let's not play. And, something else that he said that always stuck with me was checking your ego at the door whenever you go in to have that discovery, that scoping call. And that's what kind of leads to that idea of, of putting yourself in, in their shoes is you just have to continuously remind yourself that the, the, this entire relationship, this entire conversation really has very little to do with the salesperson, which I think is something that salespeople can struggle with sometimes. Cause if you're looking at, kind of a stereotypical salesperson, their high energy might be, uh, you know, the the type that that does like to, to talk a lot and, and sell a little bit. And so it's important to, to slow down and, and check your ego. Well, one of the things I think you said that's important there that can really get you off track is making the salespeople, the trans- transaction's never about the salesperson and it shouldn't be. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of salespeople fail. And Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you call me and you're like, Hey, I, I need to sell something to make my quota. I mean, that depends. Like, why, why do I give a shit? Yeah. You know? And I mean, I've literally said that. Um, and you know, it, it can't be about the salesperson in that regard. Now there's different ways to kind of work around that if you're trying to make your quota, but that yeah. said, and you know, I've been I've been a quota based salesperson in the past, and you know, in, in those cases, there were people that I've done stuff for, and I'm like, hey, I need one more sale to me- make my number, and those now good, I've right? already made I've already made a lot of deposits. Yeah, yeah, you know, with that with that buyer before I'm going to make that call, I'm comfortable <laughs> doing that at that point. But I had already done something at some point to help them be successful. And yeah, that's a great relationship. If you can, if you can make that phone call, I would suggest that even if you do have a, a really strong quota or tight quota, you're always going to hit that if you don't focus on it. Like if you if you're focusing on the right thing, that just puts more money in your pocket inherently. Yeah, and I've had people. You know, one of the things uh, 
um, in the past had a manager who was doing a great job, but with that un- unsettling some people that weren't uh, weren't our high performers. And through methods of feedback, some of that got back to so like, this guy's not this or that. Now, so, you know, that, that feedback was, it was in a channel that was discoverable by, uh, by that manager. And I asked him, I said, well, how do you feel about that? And he said, you know, I'm showing up and doing the right things every day. So I'm not worried about it. And, you know, that's kind of like what you, that kind of similar to what you just said, like yeah. do the right things. It'll kind of take care of itself. I think that, uh, um, you know, I, one of the more common questions that I've answered over the years for people in general is, well, how do I make more? Or how do I make a lot of money? And I, I it's, mystifying to them. I said, well, you have to not focus on money. Right. You got to get really, really good at something. Money's a byproduct of that in most mm-hmm. situations. Um, you know what's funny about all this is I'm just thinking about last episode and then this conversation. And that's probably what sucks for a lot of salespeople who are looking for answers about how to get really good at sales. Like there's nothing ever going to be revolutionary about how to get really good at sales or how to be successful. Like, like you said, last episode, cliches are cliches for a reason. So the, you know, our success is your success. That's, that's true because it proves itself, proves itself out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, all right. So during the sales discovery process, Mm -hmm. and this is like, this is a huge one for me. Um, you know, I, the world, if you can, if you're a salesperson and you're trying to get better, this is, or, or you're a founder, anybody, yeah. please listen to this. And if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you probably know what I'm about to say. Look, people buy stuff because of the benefits that it provides, not because of the features. So, you know, and a, a simple acronym, FAB, features, advantages, benefits. If you mention a feature, it had better be, fo- it better have a tailing comment. Yeah about its advantages and its benefits. Because otherwise, no one gives a shit. Right. They don't. Yep. I mean, it's just that simple. I And and I, I, the example I use for this is I went to, I, all right, so a few years back, wife was tired of not having great pictures. We only had, you know, iPhone pictures. Mm-hmm. I went to Best Buy. I wanted to buy a camera. And whoever it was was working there was you know probably like a twenty year old dude, and right. he's just going down this huge list of things. And I mean, dude, none. Of, I didn't even know what I I I had no idea what any of them were. Right. I none. It's none. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know what any of those things were. And he, you know, he's like literally rattling off a list. And I was like, dude, will this take a plus pictures on Christmas morning? He's like, oh well, yeah, of course. Yeah. What's it going to look like? Had, That's all I care about. That's all you had to say, bro. Yeah. That's all you had to say. That'd be different. So, It'd be different if you would have walked in with like two cameras over your shoulders and a, a bunch of gadgets that said, I'm a photographer. And then like a band, a bandolier of film canisters. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. go into the specs of the camera with me. If not, just tell me what it's going to look like. I'm not even sure those people care. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Because they're, they're chasing a benefit or an advantage. What's the advantage that whatever it is you are selling has over the competition, over the present situation? Right. What are the benefits that your service or product or whatever it is that you're selling provide? And that's really, that's it. You know, it's like, and, you know, as the founder of Gigabook, uh, I learned this pretty quickly because we built a bunch of quote features and I, you know, that's why I said, don't underestimate peace of mind because the features were like, take appointments online mm. or in take appointments. Don't miss appointment opportunities because you're asleep. <laughs> right. This takes, take online appointments 24 hours a day, take appointments while you're with other clients. Yep. Don't miss opportunities. These are advantages and benefits of a product. Now, just saying, take appointments online and, and don't assume that your buyer has any clue about what the benefits are. Even if they're an expert in whatever it is, just don't make that assumption because you never know what you, until you start throwing these things out there. So you can, you, all right. So we're talking about having that discussion. You know, someone's told you what they need. Okay, well, this is what we have to offer. Here's the advantages. Here's the benefits. Which ones of those make the most sense for you? Right. 
and yeah. they will tell you and they yeah. will usually tell you. Yeah. Opposed I, to I like, I like the idea of this being less expensive than my current option. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think we, we've talked about how sales discovery isn't, isn't about selling and, you know, kind of moving off the solution, but there are, there are just parts of that conversation that naturally come up where you do have to discuss what your, what your offering might be. And that's wherever this, this idea of, you don't even need to talk about your, your features. You just need to talk about your benefits. You can bring up your features during the next episode closing. That's when you talk about some features, but during this piece, it's just complimenting whatever it is that they're they're talking to you about and, and potentially asking you about. With the, I mean the fe- the features are the features are about you should spend about as much time as you spend on a, a, as a, a, looking at a sign that you drive past eighty miles an hour on the yeah. on the freeway. You know, it's like, I mean, that's the whole thing. And remember, people buy benefits, not features. And you know, it's like, I don't know, FAB. It's just features, advantages, benefits. Very simple. By the way, being a being, I think that being a top salesperson is simple. I think people complicate it with their own crap. Yeah, it's so really it's just hard. To, all right, it's difficult to to implement and stick to. So I want to I want to save some time for my my short soapbox session on personality types. Okay. So I'm going to let you take this next one, uh, the the last one on your list. The. Uh, professional doesn't equal formal talk to me so something that i i noticed really about my myself before it, it became aware to me everywhere is that your emails and your communication don't have to be and probably shouldn't be really really formal and and buttoned up in terms of um thank you very much or best wishes or um, yeah, yes, sir, no, sir type communication, not because you shouldn't respect who you're speaking with, but that's just not how you talk. And that's not how most people talk. And whenever you're in a, a situation where you might be going through a sales process via email, um, h- having that extra formality in your communication, it can kind of cause some friction just because it's not natural. And so yeah, I agree. My, my, I guess my point to that is, um, Whenever you're you're reaching out to somebody, you just need to talk to them like you weren't selling them something. Like it needs to feel, it needs to feel like a regular conversation and not a sales conversation. Like you're asking, you, you can be so formal that it feels like you're asking for permission to to talk to them. Yes, sir. And email them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's it's just kind of like, hey, ha- Do you guys sell development you? services. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. That would feel weird. And you guys already weird where, You guys already determined it. It makes sense to have a conversation. So so have one. Yeah. And yeah. that's the way I, I mean, I, I got to tell you, it's, I've gotten older and I turned 45 this year. Yeah. My whole approach to selling has become very conversational and it's just kind of like, you know, now I'm in a different boat. I don't need every sale. Uh, we got a lot of, a lot of business, a lot of opportunity. In fact, we turn it down Yeah, and you know, I'm more concerned about finding the right kind of clients than just clients. And I think that I don't think I know our clients appreciate that because they're looking for some long term solutions. Now, Mm -hmm. look, everything that we talked about and everything that we've brought up here, it it can be remarkably harder if you are not speaking the language. And I don't mean English, but if you're not speaking a language or using a form of communication that's easily palatable to the recipient. Um, and that's the language of personality. So, you know, we mentioned earlier, the stereotypical salesperson has this, Hey, I just, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to sell everything and anything that's not bolted down today, yeah. Sunday, 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 sale. Yeah. you know, and, and the yeah. thing is, is, you know, and I'll, I'll keep this simplistic and I wrote all about it. There's a whole section in my book, Balance Me, about it. Mm-hmm. And what, how is that different? I just, overall, the personality style that you have is created by the way you view yourself. Mm-hmm. And the most simple state of that is a type A and a type B personality. Right. Okay. Now, a type A, you and I, Cooper, we're both type A personalities. We're outward. We're not introverted. That's not the, that's not that's not a, okay. Introverted is never a word anybody has ever used about me. I mean, I've, yeah, I, I, would, I assume that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I'm, it's not you either. It's, no, it's not, no. it's not where it comes from. Now the thing is, so that's a type A personality an introverted or a quiet, more analytical person is typically re- it can be referred to as a type B. Now there's all kinds of personality styles and different stuff out there. And you can be an EJ, NBI, whatever the fuck, yeah. right? <laughs> or you can, I like the, I like disc, which is driven or influential, steadfast or conscientious. It doesn't matter in the end. You're kind of all type A, type B, introvert, extrovert. Yeah. If you are an extroverted person, you have a high likelihood of alienating a type B listener yep. by the way that you're, the, the, your approach. And there, and you have to understand that during the qualification process because, and it's the same way. If you're a type B and you're speaking to an A, you're going to have a, a different set of problems yeah. from, from, from an introverted, uh, uh, person to the uh, a type b recipient if you're if you're talking too fast they think you talk too fast and you don't you don't even stop and you don't even give a shit about the details you're just like sell 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 yeah that's the way they hear it even if you're not talking like that and the problem is is that that isn't received very well it's seen as flighty uh not detail oriented like you i mean it can be very it can be uh, kind of almost frightening yeah now on on the other the other way, um, if you're so if you're a type A person, you will do well with other type A people. Mm-hmm. If you're a type B, you will do very well. But you got to start working on figuring out how to speak to the other half. Mm-hmm. And you know, I learned this my se- firsthand uh, when I first got into sales. I was 25 years old. And I was doing great selling to people that were like me, and I could I could tell that I wasn't doing well at all <laughs> speaking to a different type of buyer. Yeah. So at the time, this was before podcasts and the internet was still pretty young. Mm-hmm. Uh, dial up. I remember dial up Ooh. at the store that I worked at. Yeah, that's about how slow shit was. Yeah. And. So I went down to the Barnes and Noble because I was going to get some books on selling and I saw a book called How to Mind Read Your Customers. Um, I read it and I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I needed. And it laid out the reasons why. Um, and I was so impressed with the book. I'm actually, I actually became friends with the author later wow. and I participated in, in, oh, I've participated in the administration of several hundred personality uh, profiles and, you know, and I've learned a lot about it and I've spent a lot of time because overall, whether it's in selling or in life or anything else, Mm -hmm. it's very important to have a baseline understanding because our personalities really do dictate a lot, especially when it comes to today's topic, which is buying. So like type B people do not make fast buying decisions and trying to make them and trying to get them to is actually going to move you further away. Absolutely. And I, and we're going to talk, I'll save some more of this for the closing part, Mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what, like if you won't even get to the point where you're going to close a sale, if you alienate your, your prospect on the way to it and in the discovery process as tight as extroverted people, we often aren't very good listeners. We have to understand, you have to understand, so that type B recipient, they want the details. Those people actually want the list. That's what I was going to say. That's a data-driven buyer. But you have to have the A and the B at it, right? Don't just give them a list. That's where the FAB comes in. Now, your type A buyer gives a lot. I don't even, I'll I'll list three benefits. Yeah. Better, faster, cheaper. Okay, where do I sign? Yeah. I mean, that's it. And, you know, if you're a, a type B person to a type A, Oh man, you can bore the shit out of me uh, Mm -hmm. as a buyer to the point where my eyes glaze over and I'm just like, dude, stop talking about, (laughs) I don't care. (laughs) But the point is, is that's not good. It's not moving you towards the sale. So, you know, I think overall, if you get an opportunity, learn a little bit about yourself and your personality styles. There's a lot of really uh, interesting habits that, and things and assumptions you can begin to make based on, you know, I mean, you can get really deep with this. Like there are even, I, I, I've gotten to the point where I, I assume that people ha- that have certain job titles uh, will have per- certain personality styles because they overwhelmingly trend towards that. Yeah. I mean, it's fair to make that assumption that uh, a more technical C-level 
person might have a slightly dis- different personality than a Matt DeCourcy. Well, sure. And we all have a, a different one on some level. And but it's that understanding of where you're at and it can change the delivery. And, you know, when you're when you're dis- in the sales discovery process, mm-hmm. I, in my opinion, this is part of it. This is part of it. And yeah, I mean, I 20 years later, I've become pretty adept at this. Like I I I can come pretty darn close to guessing your personality style, just watching you. Yeah. Because I mean, it's sometimes it's even like you very rarely see type B or introverted people like w- walking around like super duper fast inside a store, looking at a lot of different stuff. Yeah. They're, they're slow. They pull it off. They look, they actually look at the back. They make a That's good stuff. buying decision. Yeah. <laughs> usually. Yeah. Usually unlike me who just buys the, I'll buy three things just right. hoping that I'm cool with one of them. Yeah. And then I tell myself <laughs> I'm too busy to return the other two. So I don't know who's a better buyer, but, right. but here's the thing is, is this is a reality yeah. and having some, some understanding there, you know, some of the other things too is, is keep in mind while I think too many salespeople during the discovery process, they, all right, you're trying to, we're trying to salespeople to try to figure out who's making the buying decision. Mm-hmm. But you got to keep in mind that the person making that buying decision is likely receiving input from a whole bunch of different people. Yeah. And those are, you know, and, and I see a lot of salespeople kind of blow past that. Yeah. Well, this isn't even the person with a buying decision. Was well, it someone that's going to weigh in on it? Cause Probably you might not want to just blow up the relationship. Thing. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, it depends on, it depends on what you're, what you're selling, but yeah, I mean, a lot, most of the time there's, it's a multi-stakeholder conversation and that's a, that's a delicate thing to balance. And yeah, if you blow right by it and maybe you do get to that decision maker, that decision maker goes back to that first person you should have spent a few more minutes with and they get an opinion. And if you didn't take the time to gauge that first person's personality and communicate with them the right way, that opinion is not going to be what you want it to be. And then that comes. Yeah. And, and with, and with that different personality styles find different benefits of sales or services to be more important than others. Yeah. Yeah. Like they really will. Like a type B person would favor peace of mind over faster. Yeah. Or something looking good. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could be a whole number of different things and like, and you know, every personality style has its, it's, it's, uh, it's trends. You know, another thing that I think is pretty important and, you know, we, we kind of breeze past this is, you know, I think this is kind of a, a fundamental part, but I think a lot of people is if you're busy, whoever you're working with shouldn't, shouldn't be able to, if you're busy or stressed, the recipient uh, on the other end of the phone or wherever you're at should not, that should not, they shouldn't know. Yeah, you shouldn't get that feeling because you can make someone feel pretty insignificant in a hurry. If you're too busy to answer my questions about your service, how on earth are you going to help me when I have a real problem? Yeah, well, your whole your whole job is to make their life easier. So if right. you're going to display any type of uh, stress or busyness on your side, that's just not what, that has nothing to do with your guys' conversation. Yeah. And for those of you listening, you might even want to write that down. My job is to make your life easier. Like I'm being serious. Like if you say that as a salesperson to like, you could say that from the piano store reference to selling million dollar software contracts. Yeah. It's, it it is true. Yeah, it is true. And it, by the way, if you can make people's lives easier and you can shorten that path to the cash register, you can remove all the obstacles and it's a clear arm's length away, makes it real easy to collect cash yep. and get to the next part. We're about out of time on this one, but we're going to come back for one more day. We're going to, everyone wants to talk about closing sales. I refuse to have that conversation until we had the ones that we just had because right cart before the horse, whatever you want to call it. Like if you haven't done the steps on the, like closing is easy. Should be if you do your job, right? Easy. If you have done all the stuff on the way to it correctly, if you have not, it is a dogfight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Anything else to add here, sir? I want to add one one tactical thing. I feel like we, we've spoken a lot about like the the what to do's and what not to do's. Something that every single person should be doing before every single you know discovery call, discovery meeting. You guys need to have a, a pre call planning document. Like you need to have something that lays out, hey, here's what we're trying to accomplish in this phone call. Uh, here are the questions that I want to ask. Here are the questions that they're probably going to ask me. Here's how I'm going to answer them. Um, and they don't need to be fully you know, pressed out answers. You just need to understand, hey, this is probably something I'm going to get hit with. I need to be, be able to be prepared to answer it and tie it back to the benefit that it's going to bring to their business. Um, yeah, and those are—I mean, there's a zillion different things. And if you're if you're a founder or uh, you know an entrepreneur or someone a leader in a company, um, don't assume that your salespeople know any of the things that you know. Like, sit down and like I did that with you, and you're like right away. I'm like, hey, dude, look, qualifying our buyers is here. Here's a very short list yep. of some very basic questions, and if you can answer these. Or these are going to do, it's going to either tell you we've, we're talking to the right people or we're not. Yeah. And the collection of that data and collect it, write it down. Because if you get good at prospecting and you get good at sales discovery, oh man, salespeople are, are known for having horrible attention to detail on many days. You're not going to remember all of it. And I mean, I've struggled with that in the past and yeah. I've done some really dumb shit during the sales <laughs> discovery process. Like Ben, I've been working too quick. So I write something down on a post-it note and lose it. Yep. Yeah. You know, or just like goofy stuff. And, and, you know, the thing is, is if there's, if there's holes in the net, you're going to lose fish. Yeah. And, and if you and have the whole purpose back, of fishing was to catch fish. And if you have so, to go back and ask a client to repeat himself. You just don't look like you. I mean, it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. Yep. And I, I, I still find myself doing that some days, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's tough, but it, you know, that's like, I, I mean, I have a book that I kind of carry around and, and uh, I'll write some stuff down. It's got a collection of just weird notes in it. But the thing is, is I can get in there and find them. Yeah. And you know, I don't know. I'm super, I'm hypersensitive to people wasting my time. Like if I feel like you're wasting my time, like you have lost my attention. And in fact, assuming that whoever you're talking to is giving you about 10% of their attention, mm -hmm. that's a good start. That's yeah. a good start. So, yeah. you know, don't come across as being that person. And that's how I'm going to go ahead and end it. Now, make sure you come back Make sure you check out the thrilling conclusion of our three part here. And we're going to talk about closing sales. I know that's, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we will look back down the road and we will see, we will see that the order, the number of downloads that occurs on the closing sales episode <laughs> will grossly outclass the first two steps, yeah. which will statistically prove my point that. Salespeople in general have the fucking cart before the horse. Yeah. Yeah. So don't do it. Anyway, I got I got so much to say in that final episode. Yeah, I'm gonna get back to work. Yeah. All right, man. I'll I'll see you next time. All right. See ya.